Um, I'm Dan Shapiro. Uh, I used to do software, and then I made a board game about cardboard robot turtles with lasers on their backs, and now I make real lasers at a company called Glowforge. And somewhere in between these two things, I had coffee with a friend of mine named Jordan Weissman. Jordan makes games, excellent games. If you're very lucky, you might have played one of them. And while we had coffee, I asked Jordan what he was doing, and he told me he was making a new game. And he said, this game is a little different. It's inspired by a very old game that you've probably never played. There's two things about it that are unusual. One thing about this game that's unusual is that it is procedurally generated. Procedurally generated means like the game is is Schrodinger's cat. It's in a box, and when you open it, it springs into existence fully formed. And it is never the same way twice. It's not like Pac-Man or the Cloud World from Super Mario Brothers that's been created by a designer. It is, in fact, rendered its, in its entirety by a machine for you on your behalf. It's different every time you play it. And every time you play it, it is created just for you. Jordan's game is called Necropolis. The second thing about it, he said, is that you die a lot, and it's final. So, very old game you probably never played. I'm actually going to jump back to 1983, when a seven-year-old me went to the University of California, Berkeley, with my father, who was a professor on sabbatical, uh, and he was working with some folks at a very large computer called a PDP-11. Those are his colleagues there. And in the 1983 academic school year, there was one program that used more CPU cycles than any other. But before I tell you which one it is, how many people here have heard of the game NetHack? A roguelike game that, yeah, this is... So it's been in continuous development for 30 years. This talk is not about NetHack. But NetHack is uh, amazing in its complexity and how it's evolved over these years. As I said, NetHack is a roguelike. Jordan's game is a roguelike. This is a term that gets bandied about in the game community, roguelike, and what I'd like to talk to you about is rogue, the game that these are like. This is a fell dungeon littered with treasure and monsters, fearsome beyond belief. Behold their terrible majesty, a snake, a shambling ice monster, an aquator, which was originally called an ice monster, but then Dungeons and Dragons sued them, so they had to do a dot release and reshuffle the whole alphabet and rename all their monsters. And littered everywhere, fabulous treasures to boggle the mind's eye. Fearsome weapons, mysterious scrolls, bubbling potions, piles of treasure, and in the lower right corner, a uh, desirable beyond all measure, a slime mold, which is what passes for lunch in the Dungeons of Doom. So let us parachute in as our heroine is in pitched combat with a fearsome emu. You'll notice that the entire dungeon is rendered from the top. That's done with Ken Arnold's Curses Library, which he wrote immediately before writing Rogue to take advantage of the Curses Library. You'll also notice it pays a debt to Dungeons and Dragons, its predecessor and plaintiff, in having all the, the experience of the, uh, the, you know, the dungeon romp. A remarkable amount of complexity for a game at its time. You'll also notice that you die a great deal. And in fact, the majesty of the game is learning the subtlety and the strategy and the puzzles while being killed over and over again, usually by trolls. So, what makes this game work 35 years later? It is the magic of a world that is created in its entirety for you, anew each time. 26 levels, parachuting down through the dire dungeons to the lowest level where I am told by my father that there lies a treasure, which I have never seen, but he told me about once before he died by a troll, called the Amulet of Yendor. And here it is, in its glory, a comma. In 35 years, I've seen it once and I've never won the game. Now, to wrap your head around what this game is like, let me show you a picture that represents it. This picture is 102 by 180 pixels. The reason this picture represents Rogue is because this picture takes up 50 kilobytes of computer memory, the entirety of the game. It is a very old game that you've probably never played. But the game has been updated. I do have good news for those of you who look upon this and see the green cast and say maybe that's not for me, because the most modern of the extended ASCII 
character set, and CGA graphics have in fact been ported. So if you would like, you can get a full color rogue experience. Depending on your preference, I recommend the version 3.6, which was the last one from the original Rogue maintainers. Or if you want the stunning adrenaline rush of full Rogue color, you can go for Rogue Clone 4, which was ships with BSD, I believe, and is an open source recreation of the Rogue code base. Three generations of my family play Rogue. My father played it 35 years ago. He taught me to play it, and now I play it with my seven-year-old kids. But Rogue is not a relic. It's not just interesting for how did people make games back then. It is a brilliant jewel that is still, to this day, both challenging, insightful, and thought-provoking. So I encourage you, go grab your favorite platform, wander out onto the internet, and grab a version of Rogue. Download and play it, and shoot me a note. Let me know you what you think. I'm Dan Shapiro. Thank you very much. Woo!